Well, thanks everyone. I hope you had a nice lunch and um, ready to learn about a silicon compiler, which uh, that, that phrase has um, been in our industry for a very long time. I mean, uh, 80s, uh, there was silicon compiler systems, yep. But I, I, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Andreas Olsen, who's the program manager at DARPA. And he's going to tell us what DARPA's been up to, uh, what, what's he's trying to make happen, and, and how we can all help. All right, so uh, this is uh, DARPA building a silicon compiler. So uh, as many of you know, we're kind of losing the complexity battle in chip design. Um, costs have been skyrocketing, right? People are talking about a billion dollars per chip at seven nanometer. And uh, you know, one thing you should know though is it's not one number, right? It's actually a very wide distribution. So it can be a, a billion dollars down to uh, something much smaller, right? Um, you know, the billion dollar price tag is probably for an incredibly complex smartphone SOC or uh, some kind of GPU with lots of software and drivers. Um, if you were to do a, a much smaller chip, like uh, let's say the original Intel 4004 with 2000 transistors, it wouldn't take you very long. So the dynamic, dynamic range is, is huge. And uh, so, you know, I'll give you a, a data point, right? So before joining DARPA, um, the last chip I did, was a four and a half billion transistor design. Um, it was highly replicated. Uh, I did it in, uh, in, in a year, basically by myself. Uh, and, uh, you know, about a million dollar cost to the government. Uh, and uh, that's kind of what I joined, uh, joined DARPA because I wanted to enable that kind of compilation for everybody. So what I created was a very tuned generator. I thought, you know what, maybe we can create a compiler, uh, something much more general purpose. So um, that's basically why I came to DARPA and what I want to solve. So what are we doing? Uh, we kicked off this program two uh, weeks ago. Uh, the uh, uh, RFI went out in September. Uh, proposals came in in the fall, and we selected the teams. And uh, so it's about a $100 million investment to create the silicon compiler. That's a, that's a pretty big chunk. Uh, probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest, EDA research program uh, that's uh, ever been. And uh, it's a big goal. Um, but uh, as was mentioned, right, silicon compilers have been around for uh, a while, since the 1980s. What's different uh, now? And uh, there's a few things uh, that we're doing, trying to do different. Um, one is we're not shooting for the highest performance. So uh, we're not going for 100% PPA. Uh, this is really what's driven the industry over the last 20 years is lower the cost, lower the cost, higher performance. That's how silicon merchant vendors stay competitive. Here we're saying, nope you got to focus on automation. It has to be a true silicon compiler, the way we think of a software compiler. So, for example, I mean, imagine a, somebody writing Python code or Java code, and you have to tell that person, no, no, I, you know, I'm not going to give you the complete executable to run. I'm going to go 90% of the way, and you're going to have to go in and, and muck with the assembly code, right? That would never work. We would never have the software ecosystem they have today. So complete automation is a game changer. But, um, you know, there's no trick here. There's no magic bullet. We're going to have to give something up. And what we're going to give up is performance. So that, that's kind of the, the, the boundary conditions for the program. And so if you see here, right, that's a Raspberry Pi, right? So you've got a board design. You've got a package design for the silicon. You've got the actual silicon in there. So the, the goal of the program is to generate something that looks like this or more complicated completely from scratch, from source code, so that you get the GDS2 out for all the components on there um, automatically. So the end state, which I would like to see at least, uh, is something like this, where you would uh, uh, you'd have source code somewhere, source code for the compiler, like you have for GCC or LVM. It could be a proprietary compiler, uh, if that can serve our needs, but let's take GCC as an example. You download GCC, now you have something to compile your source code with. You download repositories, from GitHub or other places, uh, all the components you can imagine so that you can focus on, on your value add. In addition, you can imagine having complete SOCs up on the web, uh, one through SOC 1000, to build as needed, build to order. So, so that's kind of the vision of the program. It's, you know, clone, clone, make would be making a chip, three commands. Um, <coughs> so the power automation um, is, is quite disruptive, right? You have to think about it that once you have this compiler, right? Now we've taken care of the, the layout portion. What can we do with that? 
Well, this might take us from schematic to GDS2 or um, uh, Verilog to GDS2. So some people might say, Verilog, well, it's too low level, it's too hard to use. Well, you can string together a high level language to that and then have a full end high level language to GDS2. Um, same thing on the back end, right? So today, there's quite a lot of work to be done um, in the logistics of getting things built and, and things designed. What if we have a compiler? Uh, can we actually do build to order? So imagine a, an Amazon style uh, shop where you have lots of selections to choose from. And in Amazon, of course, you buy from the shelf, right? There's lots of components on the shelf that just get shipped to you. What if the component never existed, right? You're actually building something new and unique uh, for your needs. What can we do with that? So I think you, you know, once you start thinking about automation and what is, has meant for software, uh, you realize that automation is much, much more important than uh, power performance in area. Another way of thinking of it is um, ASICs are much more efficient than, in, than in CPUs and GPUs. We know that, right? So you've seen the graphs from, from the past showing that ASICs are 10 to 100 times more efficient than, let's say, GPUs, which are 10 to 100 times more efficient than uh, CPUs, something like that. Um, well, a lot of times costs come and get in the way, and uh, we can't build those ASICs, even though we need it uh, for reasons of size, weight, and power. So if you can build the ASICs, we know we can get to from 100 to 1,000x performance improvement. Um, and so if we have to give back half of that because you know, we, we favor automation over PPA in our silicon compiler tool, we're still ahead by, let's say, 50 to 500. 50 to 500 in size, weight, and power is a huge deal. So the idea here is explore, innovate at the architectural level. Don't tweak a few percent at the implementation level. That's kind of the, the, the constraints of the program. So participants, this is the first time we're actually disclosing who, who's on the program. This kicked off two weeks ago. Uh, it's a pretty big team. Uh, 22 teams in total. There's a, a few contracts that are, aren't quite done yet, so we're not going to disclose them. But uh, you got a rock star team here, truly, right? Uh, from the community, uh, from academia, and from industry. Uh, so you got uh, UC San Diego, Brown, uh, Washington, Purdue, Utah, uh, UT Dallas, Michigan, BU, Princeton, Yale, UVA, Cairo, USC, Illinois, and Carnegie Mellon. Right? And, and a couple of others. On the commercial side, we've got Synopsys, Cadence, Arm, Qualcomm, NVIDIA, Xilinx, ADI, JITX, Northrop Grumman, Global Foundries, Lockheed Martin, uh, Moses, Analog Circuit Work, Lewis, and Sandia. So the idea here is that we have academia for maybe some of the blue sky research that's going on, but we also have a great team of people who have bled semiconductor for 20 years and know where all the bodies are buried. So, the idea here is that combine the two and, uh, and we can do something uh, truly disruptive. So you know, another look at you know, how big is this team, right? So to build a silicon compiler is a huge software engineering project, right? It is, uh, um, that is in fact one of the biggest challenges of doing something like this. So uh, we've got uh, 44 professors, 70 professional engineers from industry and postdocs and, and 100 grad students. So that's about 200 people working on this, uh, and they're going to be working on this for uh, four years. Uh, and uh, so it's a, it's a big enough team, and uh, I think we're well positioned. So uh, I'm not going to steal the thunder of the people working on the research. I mean, we just kicked off two weeks ago uh, in Boston. And, uh, but I do want to mention a few of the efforts, a few of the focus areas that people are working on uh, to give you an idea. Uh, I expect uh, many of these researchers are going to be publishing great results and, and even having products on the floor here in, in a few years. So um, Cadence is working on uh, no human in the loop analog layout. Uh, Yale is working on asynchronous design. It's, you know, we're finally going to have a standard set of uh, asynchronous design tools. Uh, UCSD is working on, on Verilog to GDS2 full flow, uh, completely open source. Um, JDX and Northrop Grumman is working on a, a design by intent synthesis engine at the board level. So imagine expressing a board in, in very few parameters and getting a full PCB out. Uh, University of Washington is working on a, on a set of open source uh, analog IP blocks, as well as a, a from scratch community centric RISC-V uh, platform written in uh, System Verilog. Uh, Synopsys is working on uh, mixed signal emulation. So imagine uh, you know, emulating a chip that has 
analog components as well as digital. Um, and, uh, and Xilinx is working on, a, on an open source mixed uh, hardware software emulation platform. So think uh, QEMU combined with FPGAs and Verilator uh, as well as other components. So the idea here is uh, uh, all working together to build a community and ecosystem around this uh, silicon compiler. So um, just you know, a little more technical detail of what we're trying to do. So uh, if you look at uh, how the chips are designed today, right? it's very siloed. Uh, you've got uh, one set of tools and one set of expertise knowledge for SOCs. You've got one set of expertise and, and tools for uh, SIPs, system and package, and one set for PCBs. And uh, a lot of time, the knowledge and information is embedded inside the heads of, of the designers. And you know, those designers are, are quite scarce. I, if you're working at one of the big semi companies, there's generally a fair amount of talent to go around. If you're a system company, there's less talent. If you're in DoD and you need somebody with security clearance, it is very, very difficult to locate a single person with the right knowledge at an advanced node. So that, that idea of, of the humans being the, uh, the scarce uh, commodity uh, is key here um, because it gets in the way of getting our job done. So in the future, what are we thinking about? We're thinking about how to embed the knowledge of the humans, um, not just optimizing algorithms for doing placement and routing and uh, timing closure, but actually embedding the knowledge inside the tools or inside the models that drive the tools. And the question is how we're gonna achieve that. The kind of the obvious vector today uh, with everything going on is gonna be machine learning. I think there's a lot of questions on what's gonna be the mix of the algorithms versus machine learning. What type of machine learning is gonna be uh, data centric? How, how are we gonna get the data, right? That is a big question in a world where, you know, kind of Andy Grove style, only the paranoid survive. Right? Data is not shared. Everything's locked by, down by NDA. This is a big challenge for the program for sure. Um, but it's uh, quite exciting because we, if we can achieve this, and fundamentally from having done chip design for 20 years, I see no reason why things that I know and things that mass designers know cannot be extracted uh, and embedded in tools. Um, I think we, just, we have to have the will, we have to have the funding to try, but uh, it will get done. So uh, when I presented this uh, idea in the past, um, I either get, well, we already do automated place and route, right? It's already solved. Or for analog, oh, that's an impossible problem. You can never automate analog design. Well, we're going to try to do both. Uh, and uh, they're very different problems. But I just want to kind of give you an idea of sort of the direction for how you could apply machine learning to analog. It's a little bit cartoonish, but um, it should give an idea. So if we think about analog design, uh, a, an engineer will design a circuit uh, and optimize it, will have some predictive models, some uh, estimated parasitics, and, and tune the device, right? Select architectures for a certain geometry. But then generally in big companies, you'll have a mass designer with uh, often uh, no, no engineering experience, right? Just uh, um, you know, laying down polygons based on directions from the designer. And directions will be things like, well, I, w I need these uh, devices to be matched, right? These devices to be symmetrical. Uh, these uh, lines need to carry a certain amount of current, uh, and so they need to be a certain width, and, and I want isolation on these blocks. So you have these vocabularies and these directions for how it should be done, uh, and then it becomes kind of a puzzle to, uh, to create the, the optimal power performance and area for that device. You extract it, and then hopefully you don't have too many loops. And the number of loops you have between the engineer and the mass designer will depend on how well they communicate, right? Usually how long they've been together how long they've been working together. And uh, there are a lot of things that maybe go unsaid. There's some aesthetics involved with analog layout uh, that aren't, isn't always modeled, but um, a lot of challenges. Fundamentally, uh, you could imagine having, if you had access to infinite data, that you could actually extract these features right, from the data so that the next time you get a schematic, you can detect a pattern and then know what strategies to apply. That is kind of the, in a nutshell, what could happen for uh, analog machine learning. There are other approaches as well, but um, uh, the idea here is that the machine will replace the polygon push in the layout. Another effort that, uh, uh, that JDX and, and Northrop Grumman is leading uh, is this intent-driven synthesis. So I've designed a few boards in the past and I found it excruciating, right? So you start off with kind of a high-level spec, uh, a few parameters, Things like, I'm going to have DDR, I'm going to have USB, maybe an HDMI port, 
this is the size of the board that I want. And then you quickly explode in the number of details you need to worry about. Right? All the resistance capacitors, right? What kind of voltage tolerance? What kind of temp tolerance? Um, what kind of size of footprint? Uh, and uh, what kind of cost, availability, uh, and so forth. So you explode from these five constraints to hundreds of things you have to worry about and optimize. And there are no optimization tools today, basically in, in board design, for the bomb. So you do it manually. And more often than not, you reach a suboptimal solution. So why can't we have a board level uh, design uh, um, approach where we specify a few details, generate correct boards, not necessarily what we need, we filter it down, and then do optimization on the parts. Um, if you look at how many boards are designed every year, the upside here is actually enormous. So to give you uh, an idea of the kind of uh, challenge of this, uh, of this kind of program though, in order to do design by intent, uh, you need to model everything. In chip design, we already do that. We have a LEF and a dot .lib for every standard cell, for every memory, for every IO, everything described mathematically. So you can actually run static timing analysis. Uh, you can do some kind of mapping or synthesis. In the board space, we don't have that. We have data sheets, which are written in English. We have app notes that try to fill the gaps of how to use the data sheet. Uh, and when that doesn't work, we have a reference design. And when that doesn't work, we have an FEE. Right? And usually, I pick parts if I have all four of those, because I don't trust that there's no gap in the English and the description. Um, so if we want to enable something like this, we're going to have to take all of that knowledge and content and uh, pour it into something that's more mathematical, more well-described, like a lif, lef, lib, or something different. Um, and that's a pretty big undertaking. So you can imagine working with semiconductor vendors, scraping millions of data sheets, uh, or, you know, and then mathematically describing them. If you can, there's a huge opportunity here. So I've talked about mostly about the compiler portion until now. But uh, again, if you look at compilers, you know, whether it's Python or Java or C++, they're not actually that effective without a library infrastructure. Because if you don't have a library, you're going to have to write every line of code from scratch. And we know productivity is related to how many lines of code you have to write, unique new lines of code. And so Posh is, a, is, a, is an effort to try to create that library ecosystem. And we, in chip design, we have an IP ecosystem. Uh, we go out, we sign a EULA, we get the IP, we integrate it. But it's quite a shallow abstraction um, stack, right? Because of these EULAs, they restrict uh, modification, copying, distribution, even talking about it. Uh, we can't have a forum because we're not allowed to talk about it. And so the approach here is we're going to try open source for hardware. It's worked really, really well for software. It doesn't mean you replace the, the proprietary IP. It means you complement it, right? You kind of remove the, the low-hanging fruit so people can focus on what's important. Um, and that's the approach of Posh. So, but before diving into this program, we have to realize that hardware is very different from software. Software, you have a bug, you do a patch. It's kind of incremental cost of zero. In hardware, you have a bug, your company's out of business, right? Or you lost $500 million or something like that. It's a huge cost. So no, understanding that risk difference and how that affects the community and adoption and, um, um, uh, and uh, is gonna be fundamental. And so, so the, the big thing here is how can we verify and validate that a block will work? Because open source doesn't come with a warranty, right? There's no, it comes as is, right? Um, and so, we have to have much, much better tools for verification, emulation, uh, and validation that are tuned for open source, uh, which means accessible, um, probably going to have to be free, uh, or, or you know, at, at least at some price that open source developers can, can tolerate. So um, now if you look at some of the outcomes of this program, uh, it's, uh, it's got two technical areas. One is verification and validation tools and technologies. The other one is a catalog of open source components. Uh, that's going to serve as a, as a beachhead for this community. So we got one team, uh, Washington, working on a, on a high-performance uh, RISC-V core. Uh, we got two teams working on open-source FPGAs, uh, which for security reasons is a, is a big deal. Uh, for, um, we're working kind of on a catalog, like a Linux for SOC design on the digital domain. We are going to try to create the first open-source analog IP repository. doesn't exist today, right? There are... Hundreds of circuits published every year at ISSCC. As far as I know, not a single one of them has ever been published on GitHub. Uh, 
So that's going to be a breakthrough. On the Linux for SOC design, it's more like taking GitHub or open course, which exists today, but it's just not good enough to go commercial. So we're trying to raise the quality. On the sign-off level validation, uh, people are working on, as I mentioned, mixed signal emulation, uh, uh, mixed software hardware prototyping from Xilinx, and uh, formal analysis. So uh, um, hopefully, you'll, when you see a block, whether it's analog or digital, from GitHub, uh, you'll be able to uh, download it with confidence and try it out with confidence. Um, and then finally, perhaps you know, the most important thing, we have to change the culture of, of hardware design. Today, everything is siloed. You have certain partnership. But we don't have this idea of open information sharing within industry. We have certain conferences where we open up a little bit more, DAC, ISCCC, but we don't communicate on a daily basis. Right? You would never imagine having a, um, a designer from, I'm going to pick two companies, Intel and Qualcomm, or Intel and AMD, right? getting together over lunch and saying, hey, let's collaborate on a DDR memory controller. Right? Um, wouldn't happen today, but maybe someday in the future it will happen. Because in the software domain, it's already happened. GCC, right, all the chip companies contribute code to GCC. Linux, all the chip companies contribute code to Linux. So why did they do that? They did that because it was the, the best option for the industry. They realized that everybody can move faster together if they share the costs. Same thing here. There, you know, there are components that we can share. right? Work on your secret sauce, share what's not important. Um, so in terms of program schedule, right, so the, the, on the left there is the goal of the program. Uh, on the right, uh, we see the schedule. The program kicked off two weeks ago. Uh, we're going to have the first integration exercise at the end of this year. So that's when people come in with their code and their initial efforts. Think of it as a pre-alpha release, uh, internal review. Uh, uh, after one year time, we're going to have an alpha code uh, integration exercise. Um, two years is the midterm exam for the program. Uh, at that point, we should have a working silicon compiler uh, at 50% of PPA is the goal. Um, I should say so, should. I mean, this is an incredibly ambitious program. So let's say hopefully will. Um, at the end of the program, the DARPA hard goal is to reach 100% of PPA, meaning that this compiler will beat maybe not every team in the world, but a lot of teams in the world in, in physical implementation. So, um, so now I want to talk about some of the possible disruptive um, outcomes of the program uh, and, and why it's important for DoD to do this. Um, so I think that you know, the first thing is money, right? Cost drives everything, right? The, the only reason you can get a, a chip project approved at any company is if you, you show a positive ROI. They look at the market, how many chips are you going to buy, what's the profit per chip, and the NRE better be way less than that. And so, so I think one of the cool outcomes here is that if we actually make the chip design, the compilation time, zero, then you actually open up the possibility of filling whole reticles of unique designs. So uh, you know, we know what the mass cost is for a leading edge uh, tape out. It's millions of dollars. Uh, we know we can use Moses to run MPWs, but we're never going to have enough designs to really bring that cost down. Uh, for example, if you take a, a one millimeter chip, right? That's but 30 million transistors, if you, if you really pack them in. You know, 30 million transistors versus the 2,000 transistor Intel 4004. I mean, 30, you can do a lot with 30 million transistors. And let's say a radical size of 700 square millimeters. So your one square millimeter is one 700th of the tape out cost. It's really not that bad. Now, depending on your volume, you, know, you may never need to do a full mask tape out. Um, there is a lot of opportunities where if you can divide 10 million by 700, and you only need 1,000 of them, and you're a system integrator, you should build a chip. And you should build a chip at 14 nanometer or 7 nanometer. And that is not the attitude today. The attitude today is that you only start a 14 nanometer design if you're going to build millions. That's the only way to pay it off. But again, this idea of filling whole reticles with so many designs, because it's now just a compilation process, is going to change the industry. Right? It's going to change the economics. And that, to me, is, is exciting. Um, for the DoD, I think, or for any system integrator, I think it's important to realize there are certain things that low volume opportunities care about that other people don't care about. One of those is latency. Um, the commercial industry, the consumer industry, doesn't really care about aggressive latencies. 
Um, for humans, right, a couple hundred milliseconds or 100 milliseconds probably could be good enough. For our eye, maybe 30 milliseconds. For certain things, we want to get down in the microseconds. For other applications, it may even be nanoseconds. So nobody's building really circuits today to deal with nanosecond or microsecond latency. Um, and so, but if you need to do that, you can't use off-the-shelf parts. So you have to have the ability to create custom circuits for low latency. Um, and it comes back to the speed of light. The speed of light doesn't change. If you get to certain latencies, we've gone past the barrier where, where we can do something cool. Another obvious one is gravity, right? So you can imagine anything flying, right, has to fight gravity. It doesn't matter if it's a satellite or if it's a small drone. Uh, the payload is related to, uh, um, you know, your thrust of your rockets or your, uh, or your propellers. We have to reduce the, um, the weight of that processing, right? You can't put a, a summit supercomputer on there. Um, uh, so you, you're always going to be limited by, by that, uh, that weight. So by reducing the weight, which means reducing the power, which means reducing the energy, which you can only do with an ASIC, we can do new things. Um, and so new capabilities that are enabled by uh, a silicon compiler. Um, another one that's kind of cool is uh, building custom circuits that are really, really tiny. So we're getting to a point where, you know, the world around us is not changing in size, but our transistors are still shrinking, right? So now take a 2000 transistor Intel 4004, uh, that can probably fit on the size of a red blood cell uh, in the not too distant near, uh, future. So what can we do with that? I don't know, but it's very cool. <laughs> um, so that's, that's kind of some of the possibilities, uh, I think, uh, that will come out uh, of such a program. I'm going to give a little plug here. Uh, there is a DARPA ERI uh, summit coming up at the end of July uh, that are going to go over these programs and some of the other programs. I've got another program called CHIPS, uh, which has to do with chipletized uh, heterogeneous integration. Um, as well as you know, many other programs with DARPA that are going to be uh, showcased uh, at the end of July. And in addition, um, there are some thoughts of new programs coming out, new research programs in the area of emulation, AI hardware, and security. So anybody doing research, I highly recommend you attending and participating in the conversation of where, the, uh, where DARPA research should go uh, over the next year. So thank you. Questions. There's a microphone here. Good. Yeah. Uh, how can we contribute? Do, do you have this on like GitHub or something? <laughs> so, uh, so initially, at least for the program, um, the collaborations will be close to the team, but but certainly you you saw the teams up there, right? And um, Universities are basic research, so they can publish whatever they want. Mm -hmm. So you're free to approach any one of these teams and, and contribute, right? C can you at least like post, post the code somewhere as they generate it? Uh, that's really up to the researchers, right? How they handle that publication. So uh, if a university decides to post on GitHub, then you're going to see it. Okay. Do, do you have a web page for this somewhere? Working on it. All right. Yeah. Did you say there's a DARPA program in the works on AI hardware? There is a workshop uh, at the ERI Summit where we're going to talk about ideas. When you get your milestones and you put everything together as a full silicon compiler, will you release it then? Is there actually going to be infrastructure that's available to so, so the um, So in, in, the, in the RFI that I wrote, right, um, a re request for proposals, um, wrote in my preference for open source code. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, you have, you know, we had to choose between quality of the efforts and open sourceness, sure. right? And so, but if you look at the, if you look at the schedule and the milestones of the program, it talks about public releases, right, at the milestone. So certainly by the midterm, there will be a public release. Now, whether that is uh, open source, which will probably be in the case of, uh, in most mm -hmm. of the university mm -hmm. efforts, right? 
or maybe proprietary as a product on, on the DAC floor is a question, but there will be a public availability. And are you going to measure the NRE effect that you have with this particular infrastructure? Sure. So there's a, is there a part of the program that's actually producing designs focused on using yeah. the tool? Yeah, so there's, there's the design, design advisors, uh, one of them Michigan, okay. that uh, is, is uh, actually driving designs through the flow. Uh, another one is Princeton, and uh, so they're the, they're the alpha testers, right? Or they're the requirement writers, right? Because they've done chips at 16 nanometers, at 14 nanometers, and uh, they're in a good shape, including me and others, right, to really say, like, this is what we need. Fantastic. Really excited. Thank you so much Thanks. for presenting. Have you approached any uh, foundries or other fabricators about um, data relationships to actually get data on the fabrication process? And uh, what, what other features are you looking at for building these machine learning models? So, uh, uh, you know, PDKs, right? We're going to have access to PDKs. I mean, that, that's just the design rules, right? That's a kind of a minimum requirement. But in terms of actually getting chip design data, that tends to be owned by the, the, the author, right, of that design, right? So it would be more like the, the companies that use the foundries, right? Like uh, Texas Instruments or, you know, Qualcomm or somebody like that. Okay, so you're essentially leaving it to the final users of some product to have like, what I'm asking about is presumably machine learning models solving problems like place and route would be more effective with process node aware mm -hmm. data. Yep. Yeah. Um, so you, you have, so think of this like, um, if you think of a, a TensorFlow or, you know, uh, an, an image recognition um, platform, right, uh, for machine learning, the the data set is not always public, right? You've got the public data sets, but you know also that Facebook and Google and others have their own proprietary data sets, right? And they don't, they don't release their trained models either, or Nuance has it for speech recognition, right? So you protect your data very carefully. You never release the model, but you may release the, the network, the code, right? Because it's useless without the data. So that is kind of the model we envision here as well. It you know, seems very unlikely that the big semiconductor companies are gonna give up their crown jewels to train a model and then give that away. So you need to uh, take apart right, the, the network, right, the forward-looking path from the, the data and the model. Um, that makes sense. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. This has been very exciting. And then uh, Andreas.